Hello everybody, Treno here and welcome to this next episode of my series looking at interwar tanks I think should be added to War Thunder. And today we will be taking a look at the British interwar tanks. So like in previous episodes we'll do a quick recap of Britain's situation after World War I. Britain and its Entente allies had won the war, in large part due to the use of tanks. Of course Britain was the first nation to deploy tanks in the form of the heavy tanks that people generally associate with World War I, with these later being joined by the swifter, more mobile medium tanks like the Whippet and the lesser known medium Mark B and Mark C. However by the end of the war all of these designs had been surpassed by the FT-17, which would of course go on to influence most future tank designs. While the British World War I tanks were generally seen as more of a dead end and were quite obsolete by the end of the war. Not to mention due to being used extensively during the war, most of the existing British tanks were mechanically worn out. So Britain was generally forced to rely on some of the newer designs like the Mark C, which would struggle a little bit in any future conflicts. To top things all off, Britain was financially in a bad place and there wasn't much enthusiasm for massive military spending in the aftermath of the war, everyone wanted to move on and rebuild. However there were a few bright spots, because of course while Britain did suffer large casualties during the war, the UK as a whole was mostly left untouched, outside of air raids and the occasional shore bombardment. So the industry was all still there and was still running. And because Britain didn't have that many tanks left after the war, there would still be a need for replacement tanks, though preferably cheap replacement tanks. So unlike France there was a bit more impetus to develop new tanks and there wasn't really much of an effort to upgrade existing British designs. So the first tanks we will be looking at are the Vickers number no. 1 and number no. 2 light tanks, which came about from a requirement for a light tank that was capable of operating in tropical climates. And the resulting design is a rather interesting mix of old and new, with the hull's rhomboid shape resembling earlier World War I tanks, while a turret has now been fitted, which is possibly one of the first British designs to actually have a turret, bear in mind it's now the early 1920s. Despite the somewhat archaic appearance, the number 2 tank had a total weight of 10 tonnes, so only 4 tonnes more than the French Renault FT-17, which allowed the 86 horsepower petrol engine to drive the tank to a top speed of 15 miles per hour or 24 kilometers an hour, so much faster than earlier British tanks. The engine has also been moved to the rear of the tank in its own separate compartment, allowing for the main crew to be positioned at the front of the tank and away from the engine. Most sources do say that there would have been five crew members, with the turret containing three crew members, while the driver would be at the front of the tank. As for the last crew member, perhaps this was a mechanical similar role, which may not have always been present on the tank. The armour is unfortunately not the best compared to other interwar tanks however, only maxing out at 12.7mm, which doesn't protect against much more than small arms fire, with even heavy machine guns likely to be able to penetrate it, though the turret does look slightly rounded, which might help matters there at least. Unfortunately the number 1 tank only had 4 Hotchkiss machine guns in the turret, but on the number 2 it, this was upgraded to carry a 47mm quick firing 3 pounder gun, which in game fires an APHE shell with 38mm penetration at 500m, so no doubt this would be a very effective weapon, capable of dealing with practically all World War 1 tanks and most of the interwar tanks, making this a tank to be looked out for on the battlefield. A Hotchkiss machine gun was also fitted to the rear of the number 2 tank, which might help against some soft skin vehicles. In real life the Vickers number no. 1 was tested before the number 2 was built and that had a less powerful 73 horsepower petrol engine. Due to this, reliability problems and the design of the tracks, it did not do very well in trials. And despite upgrades being carried out, it doesn't seem that any further tests were done on the number 1 tank. The number 2 tank was also tested, but again mechanical problems arose and this tank would be scrapped in 1927, ending the career of these two tanks. In War Thunder however I think the number 2 could work very well as an interim design between the World War 1 era tanks and the later Vickers medium tanks, or alternatively it could be a good event vehicle, probably at 0.7 to 1.0 
with the tank being able to quickly get around the battlefield and deliver deadly fire from its 47mm gun, while being vulnerable to return fire if it does get caught out in the open. So the number one and number two tanks weren't the best tanks in the world, but some of their features did show a lot of promise. So Vickers sat down and designed a new light tank, which initially entered service as a light tank, but was later redesignated as a medium tank, giving us the Vickers Medium Mark I. The chassis was now of a much more modern construction, though due to being designed as a light tank, it is severely under-armoured with a maximum thickness of just 6.25mm, practically thin enough for small arms fire to have a chance of penetrating the tank. But due to the low armour thickness and the 90 horsepower engine, the tank was able to quickly get around the battlefields, with a top speed of 15 miles per hour or 24 kilometers an hour. So it can at least avoid battles with heavier, slower tanks if required. The turret housed the Lenk 32 47mm 3 pounder gun, as well as up to four Hotchkiss machine guns. Three of these were fitted throughout the turret and one was next to the main gun, while two Vickers machine guns were also fitted, one for each flank of the hull, though not all of the guns were manned at the same time. Lastly, the crew was five, with the driver and machine gunner in the hull and the loader, commander and gunner in the turret, allowing for redundancy in crew losses in-game and in real life allowed for delegation of duties unlike some tanks where the commander had to do two or even all three roles at the same time. Unfortunately, unlike the previous number two design, the engine is now placed in the hole next to the driver, a retrograde step which no doubt made conditions worse for the crew. The Mark I would go on to have a few variants with minor improvements, such as the Mark IA which now has 8mm of armour at vertical plates and a bevel at the rear of the turret, while the Mark 1A star added a Bishop's Mitre cupola to the turret and a counterbalance at the turret rear. The medium tank Mark 1 would quickly be followed on by the medium tank Mark 2, which is very similar to the Mark 1 and basically represents a minor upgrade, with one of these being the installation of a length 43 pounder gun, increasing the muzzle velocity and thus potentially the armour penetration. And some of my sources say it was also now 8mm armour for the bog standard Mark II, but not all of my sources agree on that. Again, there are a few variants like the Mark II Star, which just adds the same upgrades as the Mark IA Star, and there is also the Mark II Two Star, which adds radios and doesn't have the Bishop's Mitre Cupola. And then lastly, the Mark II A and A Star, which had minor changes to tanks that were operating in Egypt. In real life, these two tanks would be made in large numbers, with just under 300 of both types being constructed from 1924 to 1927, at a time when no other nations were really building modern tanks in any decent numbers. The tanks would be in service until about 1938 when they would start being withdrawn, but some were still around during World War II, with some reactivated to defend the UK, with two of the tanks even taking part in battles in Egypt, though most of the tanks would end up being scrapped or used as range targets. In War Thunder, however, I think these would make great tanks that would, again like the number two tank, bridge the gap between the slower, older and less well-armed World War I tanks and the World War II tanks, again possibly at 0.7 to 1.0, with the Vickers mediums able to quickly get around the battlefield and rain fire with their quick firing 47mm guns, though of course their weak armour would represent a massive weakness that would entail having to try and avoid any stand-up fights. So Britain now had a modern tank available in large numbers which could start replacing its older, worn-out World War One era tanks, putting Britain in a pretty good place with regards to tanks. But even as the new Vickers tanks were being produced, work was begun on their replacement. As while they were technically listed as medium tanks, like I mentioned at the beginning they were designed as light tanks, and thus they did have a few problems that needed fixing, like their thin armour. Unfortunately, this is also where things start to go a little bit wrong with British tank development. So in 1926, with a requirement for a medium tank design weighing no more than 15.5 tonnes, Vickers started producing a design which would be given the designation A6, though they would often be called 16 tonners because that's how much the prototypes ended up weighing. The armour was improved over the Mark IIs, being about 13mm for the front of the tank, though reducing to 7mm for the rest of the tank, 
which is an improvement but still leaves you quite horribly vulnerable to heavy caliber machine guns. While the engine was supposed to give a top speed of 20 miles per hour or 32 kilometers an hour, and it was armed with a 47 mm three pounder gun plus coaxial machine gun in the turret. But also interestingly, there were three machine gun turrets, two with twin machine guns at the front, though in the third prototype this was reduced to a single machine gun for these turrets, and then there was a rear turret which had a machine gun for anti-air defense. So all in all, this armament was pretty good for against tanks, soft targets, and even potentially aircraft, especially if used against slower interwar aircraft. Of course, all of this required a higher crew of seven to actually man all of these turrets, as well as unfortunately reducing the gun turret crew to two, which is a retrograde step compared to the Mark I and Mark II. Three prototypes would be produced and put through tests, where the tank was actually faster than envisioned, reaching a top speed of 26 miles per hour or 41.8 kilometers an hour. Despite this, the tank wasn't seen as a huge improvement over the already in service tanks and wasn't ordered for further production. Not wanting to give up, Vickers would take another crack at the design, and in 1928, a modified design named the Medium Mark III was produced, with the main changes being to remove the rear turret, reduce the crew to 6, and improve the armour to 14mm for the front and 9mm elsewhere, which increased the weight to 16 tonnes. It also somehow, at least according to AFV Profiles 12, resulted in its top speed increasing to 30 miles per hour or 48 kilometers an hour, despite not actually changing the engine. Again, three prototypes would be produced, and in 1930 tests would again be carried out, which this time went better and resulted in the three tanks being brought and entering service in 1933. But again, no more orders were made, and by 1940 all had been destroyed in accidents or scrapped. However, the multi-turreted nature of these prototypes and the independent tank would go on to influence other nations' tank designs in the interwar period. However, in War Thunder, these two tanks would make good follow-up tanks from the Mark I and II, probably at 1.0, with the initial A6 prototypes having an advantage with the larger crew and vast array of machine guns for use against soft skin and aerial targets while the medium Mark III would have slightly better armour and a massive advantage in speed, which would make this one of the better tanks for British players to use in the early tiers before reaching the World War II era cruiser tanks. Around this time there was also a competitor design, the A7, though this time from the Royal Ordnance Factory at Woolwich, which again resulted in three prototypes, the A7E1 to E3, with some minor differences between these prototypes. One thing that is common to all of the prototypes is that there is no machine gun turrets installed, which in real life was a good change, but in game does remove some redundancy for crew losses, as the crew complement is now reduced to 5. The armour is 14mm for the front and 9mm elsewhere like on the Media Mark III, though it seems soft steel was used for the prototypes, which wouldn't be that effective, though in game it would probably have actual armour, and again, the armament was initially the 47mm 3 pounder gun. Though in the case of the E2 and E3 prototypes, the turret was later modified to use the 40mm 2 pounder gun, with a penetration of 52mm at 500m with the stock AP shell versus 38mm for the 47mm gun's APHE shell. So much more powerful, but of course lacking in killing power after penetration. Lastly, the first two tanks used a 120 horsepower engine, while the E3 used a twin six cylinder AEC 252 horsepower engine, which resulted in the E1 and E2 struggling to get past 15 miles per hour or 24 kilometers an hour, while the E3 could reach about 25 miles per hour or 40 kilometers an hour, though even this was limited by the suspension. Again, the design showed some promise, but in 1937, development was stopped and went no further. Though the turret design would go on to be used in the A9 and A10 cruiser tanks, while the E3's engine would be used for the Matilda II infantry tank. So at least the A7 did make a good contribution to British tank development. In game, I think all of the variants could be added, both with the 47mm and 40mm guns, probably around 0.7 to 1.0, as these represent good tank designs, able to hit hard and get around a decent speed but let down by their suspension and, again, their lack of armour. 
So unfortunately, despite some early successes in the 1920s, after almost 10 years of subsequent development, Britain didn't really have a worthy successor to the Vickers medium tanks. And this would be the case until the creation of the Cruiser Mark I and Matilda II in the late 1930s. And even then, Britain only had 143 modern tanks in service at the start of World War II. Of course, there is one more design in the ever-famous Vickers 6-ton tank, which is already in the game in the Finnish subtree, and four were used for training by Britain, and so it could be added in the British tech tree relatively easily. Like with France and Germany, there was also a number of machine gun armed British tanks and tankettes from this era, primarily for use in the colonies and as reconnaissance tanks, from the one and two man Morris Martel to the more famous Carden Lloyd and light tanks Mark I to Mark VI. The Morris Martel and Carden Lloyd tankettes would likely be very difficult to use in game, as though they were very fast, they had very light armour and limited rifle calibre machine gun armament. Though the Carden Lloyd would go on to be sold in large numbers to other nations, and would be the basis of numerous tank designs abroad, and both tankettes could be added at a very low battle rating of 0.0 to 0.3. But some of the light tank designs could fare a little bit better in game, particularly the Mark V and Mark VI, which were fitted with a 303 machine gun, but also a 50 calibre Vickers machine gun which in-game would have a penetration of 24mm at 500m with AP bullets, which is a pretty respectable performance, especially in the interwar era where armour is usually pretty thin. The Mark 6C did carry a 15mm Besser machine gun instead, but I don't think the performance on that is drastically different, but it could still be added. As to be expected from a light tank, speed is pretty good at around 35mph or 56km an hour for the Mark 6, though the armour only maxes out at around 15mm, but a three-man crew is carried, which is a pretty good feature. The Mark V and Mark VI would be pretty good light tanks for the early tiers, probably at around 0.7 to 1.0, mostly geared towards recon work and engaging soft skin vehicles, but can even tussle with tanks if flanking or sometimes even frontally if used against very early tanks with thin armour, which could make these very dangerous foes to contend with. As well as regular tanks, Britain did also experiment with SPGs, which in 1923 resulted in the creation of the Birch Gun, which used a modified medium Mark II chassis fitted with an 18 pounder 83.8mm gun, with 360 degrees coverage and could in theory be used against ground and aerial targets, though I suspect in game it would primarily be used as a tank destroyer. Now in real life it seems only HE, smoke and shrapnel shells were carried by the Birch Gun, but by 1939 an APHE shell had been produced, so potentially this could be used as well, where I suspect it would perform about the same as the 75mm on the Shah 2C, while the HE shells wouldn't perform as well due to having less than 1kg of explosive, which might cause some issues but at least it would be useful against soft skin vehicles. As for the rest of the stats, the five man gun crew plus driver are completely exposed, so even machine gun fire would be lethal to this vehicle, while the top speed is about 18 miles per hour or 29 kilometers an hour, which is pretty respectable. Four examples of the Birch gun would be constructed and put through testing in 1926-27, and these performed well compared to towed guns, but some changes were recommended, so two new Birch guns were ordered to the new specification, with one of the big differences being a half enclosed turret for the crew, which does provide some limited protection but increases the weight of the vehicle by one ton, reducing the top speed to 16 miles per hour or 25.7 kilometers an hour. So a bit slower, but again, still a pretty respectable speed. Despite this, the gun still performed well in testing, but the program was still ultimately ended. Not because of any issues with the tank themselves, but due to the fact that many army officers of the time just didn't see the need for a self-propelled gun, instead preferring wheeled guns towed by tractors. And to be fair, there are some advantages. Uh, towed guns can be a little bit easier to conceal, and of course the birch gun, even with the gun shield, is still pretty vulnerable, which to me just seems like an argument to have both types of equipment, but I suppose with limited funds, that does make the decision a little bit easier, though Britain would end up having to develop SPGs during World War II anyway, so obviously wasn't the best decision in hindsight. In War Thunder however, I think both variants could do very well, 
probably at Battle Rating 1.0, as they give some much needed fire support for British tanks that so often lack large calibre AP or HE shells at the early tiers. And although the initial version is completely unarmoured, the later variant with the half enclosed turret does provide at least some protection from machine guns, making this a decent vehicle to use for long range shooting. And so that's it for this episode looking at British interwar tanks that I think should be added to War Thunder. I'd be interested in your thoughts on these vehicles, as well as any other tanks you'd like me to cover. I look forward to reading your comments below. So I'll probably be covering the Americans for the next episode, and hopefully we should have quite a few vehicles there which should be interesting, and I hope you'll join me for that video. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the episode. I've been Toreno, and I'll see you next time.